Uh, thank you, everybody. So just to introduce myself, uh, I'm, I'm new to OWASP. I just became a member a few months ago. Uh, on the, on the internet, I go by Little Dan. So I'm, I'm a developer at Bloomberg, um, working on what we call the JavaScript infrastructure and tools team. We're working on modernizing JavaScript for use in building the Bloomberg terminal. And I've been working on standards for, uh, maybe eight years at this point, been contributing to TC39, which is the JavaScript standards committee, um, adding new features to the programming language. Um, related to that, I got an administrative role in this, being vice president of ECMA International, where ECMA is sort of the, the standards developing organization which sits above DC39. And I currently live in New York. Previously, I was living in the coast of Catalonia. Uh, you can see my town's one beach. It's sort of shaped like a triangle, so you it just gets a tiny bit of beach, uh, but it's worth it. Las Roquetas del Garraf. So the... Uh, Bloomberg Terminal. I, I said I worked on the Bloomberg Terminal. Uh, this is a big piece of software that helps uh, clients get financial information that they can use to make decisions about uh, about finance. And this is a very complicated user interface. It's actually internally based on uh, open source software, and <clears throat> and it's built on standards. So. The, the front end, the client side, is all based on Chromium. It's all based on, on Google Chrome, uh, with the various technologies like HTML, CSS, and JavaScript being used to program the user interface. And also, throughout the stack, we use Cyclone DX to manage, uh, Cyclone DX SBOMs to manage software supply chain security. So, when building and managing a, a complex application like the Bloomberg Terminal, there's technology like that that's built in standards, not only in code. So to improve security, improve the standards. This is just a, a core part of building secure applications. It's a, it's a longer term part, but it's still, um, still there. Sometimes it seems like standards have been around forever and they were just sort of imposed by some outside force. But actually, standards can be changed. It does take time. Months is, is very fast. Uh, often, usually, things take years. Uh, but they're open to influence by everybody. You can change standards. Standards are generally, modern standards, are developed in these open source style processes, usually via GitHub. And they are seeking input from security experts and application developers like you all. I think we have too small of a community of people developing standards, and I, I came here to this conference because I really want to broaden that and get all of your input and participation in, in building the more secure uh, internet. So as a more concrete example of how standards work, I want to walk through the JavaScript feature standardization process. So I mentioned ECMA International. This is the uh, SDO, the standards developing organization that JavaScript is developed inside, and TC39 is the 39th technical committee of ECMA. ECMA uh, doesn't stand for anything. It used to be the European Computer Manufacturing Association, but now it's it's like KFC. It's just ECMA. Um, so what we develop is the uh, the ECMAScript specification. We call it ECMAScript because JavaScript is, I guess, an Oracle trademark. And so officially it's ECMAScript, but you can just say JavaScript. And it's just a big HTML page. It's like something like a thousand pages if you print it out. So please don't do that. But, uh, <clears throat> but you can just go on our website, tc39.es and see the, see the standard. And it's just developed in a GitHub repository. You can just make pull requests against it. It's all, it's all just code. TC39, when it makes changes to JavaScript, has a process of four stages that proposals go through when they're being considered. In stage one, an idea is brought to be under discussion. It's on the table in the committee. At stage two, the committee decides, we want to move in this direction, and we have a first draft. At stage three, we have a final draft. 
of the proposal with tests. And at stage four, something is fully uh, broadly implemented and part of the standard. So this is a security conference. I want to talk about how new features or changes to JavaScript and other standards can help solve uh, or create defenses for the OWASP top 10. And one of these defenses is called Shadow Realms. This is a feature of JavaScript that intends to provide protection against software and data integrity failures. The goal is to run plugins at reduced privilege. Sometimes you have a big application and you have smaller plugins that you want to run inside the application. But the plugins are not really supposed to be able to take over the whole application or even see all the data that's flowing through it, just to see sort of the relevant data and interact with that. So you want to run JavaScript in an isolated context. And one strategy is iframes. So on the web, you can embed uh, a page inside of another page, and the embedded one is called an iframe. So that gets its own JavaScript context. And there are two types of iframes. There's a same origin iframe and a cross origin iframe. With a cross origin iframe, by that I mean uh, in, in your iframe tag, you have a URL. And then that URL can be from a, from a different website. So a cross origin iframe is completely isolated from the surrounding page. It can only communicate by passing messages back and forth with post message. Whereas the same origin iframe can uh, communicate by, um, you know, it's basically running inside the same JavaScript process. But it does have a separate uh, context that it's running in. So uh, Figma tried this. Figma used uh, same origin iframes and a piece of software called the Realm Shim in order to build their plugin infrastructure. Unfortunately, uh, that had too big of an attack surface. Using same origin iframes uh, was possible to construct some sort of isolation, but there are just too many small problems that could come up because ultimately the JavaScript is running inside the same process and it's too easy to get from one point to the other, or there's just too many different points to block. So in TC39, we've been developing Shadow Realms, which run JavaScript within a particular boundary. It's different from cross-origin iframes, where you have to do a post message to get something in, but it's still uh, it, it's more efficient than that because it can do synchronous access into and outside. It does this by only allowing certain types of data through a boundary. Primitives, like numbers and strings, uh, but not objects. So this allows interaction between the two components, the shadow realm where you run the plugin and the outer application to be controlled. And this has been added to JavaScript. Well, it's not part of JavaScript yet. It's in the middle of the standards process but it's been developed based on collaboration between many different uh, groups. Sometimes uh, people get the impression that when things come into Chrome or into JavaScript, it's just, you know, this is just Google who, who just did it. Uh, but and, and Google plays an important part, but the development happens earlier than that based on input from many parties. Uh, Salesforce, Egalia, and Agoric collaborated over the course of several years, uh, bringing the discussion to the JavaScript Standards Committee. And uh, now it's at what we call stage 2.7. So to advance stages, we get consensus in committee, and we, we have meetings and we talk at, at quite some length about the different JavaScript features. Uh, stage 2.7 is a... a part in the process between stage two and three, where we've decided on the design, but the tests are not uh, completely done yet. So there are also implementations. Because all the web browsers these days, at least their cores, are open source, it's possible to just make a PR against them and contribute implementations. And all web browsers these days encourage such open source contributions. So... <coughs> Implementations for multiple browsers were contributed from the outside, and it's available either behind a flag or with that. 
patch patched in. Um, but it's not shipped by default yet. Um, so this is an example of how anyone can propose a standard with time, iteration, and consensus building. Um, just pause. Any questions on Shadow Realms? Anything people would be interested in going in more detail on? So a next thing that we've developed in TC39 is work to maintain the same origin policy. This is also related to the OWASP top 10 of, of broken access control, a frequent source of errors. So origins, just for review, are sort of the top level of a website with all the subdomains, but not the path after that. And the same origin policy says that websites can only look at data that comes from their origin, unless that other origin opted in via course. This is important for security because origins have their own authentication mechanisms, and if a particular fetch comes from a browser to an origin, that site may deliver data back to the client that it doesn't actually have the right to see. So it's, it's quite security relevant. Uh, but it's also, it's also quite subtle. There have been holes in the same origin policy kind of from the beginning of the web. So in particular, you can have what's called sub-resources, like an image tag or, or script tag that point to whatever URL you want. And this has been supported in HTML since forever. So we wouldn't necessarily design HTML this way today. In fact, I'm, I'm pretty sure we wouldn't. Uh, fonts, for example, were added more recently and have a requirement that if you reference a font that's on another domain, that has to be opted in via course. But for uh, image and script, because they're older, uh, we have to allow them in. So there's a funny mitigation here, which is we don't let JavaScript see the other resource directly. We include it in the page, it's presented to the user, but it's somehow made opaque. One example of this is if you have an image and you include it in the, uh, in the, in a canvas. So canvas being a 2D context where you can draw things that then becomes not possible to introspect. So the canvas becomes tainted if you include an image that came from a different origin because otherwise you would be able to then read the data from that other origin. Another example is if you have a cross origin script, uh, then if an error is thrown from that script, you don't get to see the error. <laughs> you just see script error. And this is, this can be confusing to people, but this is necessary also because the script, uh, even, even the error in the script might tell you what the script had in it. So when we were adding proxy to JavaScript in ES6, I'll, I'll tell you what proxy is in a minute. Uh, we detected, before it was shipped actually, a potential hole in the same origin policy. There wasn't initially a solution. So ES6, ES 2015 was actually standardized with this as a known issue, but with no solution. So the, the web browsers couldn't actually ship this until we fixed it. And at this point in time, I was in the V8 team and I worked with colleagues at, at Mozilla to propose a fix, and this achieved consensus in TC39. So the, I'm going to walk through the, the particular issue. It's, it's a little bit obscure. So first, some background about how variables work in JavaScript. Normally, JavaScript uses lexical scoping, so that the scopes are just nested inside of each other. But at the topmost part, the, the top global scope is actually an object, which we call the global object or global this. And so accessing X, it will check the local lexical scopes, and if none of those define X, it'll read the property of the global object. Now objects, JavaScript being an object-oriented language, objects have inheritance. And JavaScript's inheritance is dynamic. You can set what we call the prototype of the object, and now suddenly it inherits from that other object. So if you read a property of an object, and that property is not defined, then it will look at its prototype, or the underscore underscore proto, which you can set to, to whatever you want later. Now proxies 
are a way that you can make an object programmable. This is like get adder in, uh, in Python. So you can make it so that getting a property of an object, even if you never thought of that property name, will do some particular behavior. You can make this, this get handler. And then when you get foo, because foo is not listed in the target, it will get it, um, sorry, even if foo were listed in the target, it will, it will call this get handler and take that action. So here's the presentation that I gave with Jeff Walden of Mozilla um, in TC39, explaining the issue and, and a potential mitigation. So here's here's the uh, kind of attack. So on on your website, which you you control, you want to be able to get this cross origin piece of data. So there's this snippet of code where we we add this proxy to the prototype chain of the, the global object. Actually, object.prototype is something that the global object inherits from, so then this makes it indirectly inherit from that. And then this CSV file uh, can parse as JavaScript. It, it, uh, when you read... Uh, sorry, when this is executed, the thing is that this CSV file is completely valid JavaScript syntax. So it will actually access medicine checking as if there are properties of the object. The numbers will be thrown away, but you will leak the string contents or, or parts of the string contents. Of course, if you put something in quotes, that's just a string, but these other things end up acting like global variable accesses. So that is a leak in the same origin policy. This is the same kind of leak that people want to prevent with script error. So if you just included this as a script tag without putting in the uh, without putting in the uh, this thing on the global object, it would throw an exception because medicine isn't defined. But then it wouldn't uh, show you medicine because it would be replaced by script error. But now with proxy, the the name is visible. So before proxy, this attack was less plausible because you had to add getters and setters for each individual thing that you wanted to test for. But now that becomes impossible because, um, because it becomes possible because you can add just this one proxy handler. And I was wondering, because this thing kind of depends on the lack of MIME type checking. Every resource, when it's sent over the network, has its, uh, has its MIME type attached to it, its content type. And, you know, we shouldn't really be running CSV files as scripts. But it turns out that another legacy thing is that scripts just don't check for their MIME type. With, with ES modules, something we added more recently, we check for cores, we check for, uh, for MIME types. But with these existing scripts, it would be web incompatible. It would break so many existing websites if we checked for that. So we need a different solution. And the solution was to lock down the prototype chain of the global objects. So object.prototype, but also the, the various other things that are in the inheritance hierarchy of the global object all have immutable prototypes. They can't be, they can't be changed what their inheritance is. And that way, a proxy can't be inserted. Firefox was the first to implement this, and uh, they found that it didn't break websites. So, um, yeah, we we were debating whether to make this a more general feature. We decided to do it just for this one object, and the the change received consensus in TC39. So it became part of the ES 2016 standard, and that enables um, shipping proxies in JavaScript. Kind of obscure, but we really want to pull out all the stops to maintain all of these security boundaries. Uh, any questions? Oh, okay. One thing that's currently under development is, is trusted types. 
This is intended to attack another OWASP top 10 vulnerability, which is injection. And in particular, I want to focus on injection of scripts. So the attack is the, the attacker is somehow injecting code JavaScript into the web page. And the defense is, what if the browser only ran the code that you actually asked it to run? So an earlier talk today mentioned that there are three ways, at least, that you can run JavaScript in a script tag, in an event handler, uh, like on something that's an, an attribute of an element. And third, these JavaScript colon URLs. So having to remember all these different places where code can run is error prone. People just don't end up remembering all of it. And it's useful to instead um, <clears throat> just have a global switch that says, no, you cannot run code that's inserted later. CSP allows different policies about which code you can run. For example, you could say you can only run code if it's listed in a script tag and either it's uh, in line in the page or it comes from some other origin uh, that's on this list. So you give a list of origins that you permit. Uh, and that can be controlled by HTTP headers, the policy. Here's an example of an attack. If you have a div inserted in the page, and that div is based on filling in a variable that the user provided, which could be done on the server side or could be done on the client side, then if we don't check for, for example, ending the quote and um, putting some other attribute, which adds on blur, then, then it can start running code. And CSP lets you block these particular kinds of scripts. Uh, so in this case, people might try to sanitize things by, for example, checking whether you're inserting a script tag, but then you might leave out the other cases. So it's very useful to, to uh, have this global fix. A PSA. If you're using CSP, the modern way to do so is with this policy called strict dynamic. With strict dynamic, uh, so the, the particular scripts that you can run are controlled by script SRC. This is a directive within your CSP policy. And what you do is you pass a nonce, you pass this random uh, string generated per request that's then supposed to correlate to the string that's in the script tag on the page. And um, what strict dynamic says, in addition to checking for the nuns, then this script tag can insert other script tags. So it, it has some flexibility, but it also makes sure that things are only permitted if either they have this matching number or they uh, are kind of descendants of that. Other strategies, like checking for origins, have long been known to just be too uh, easy to trick. It's somehow too easy if you can if you end up being able to insert another URL to build some kind of gadget to run some other code. Uh, so please use strict dynamic with CSP. Anyway, people don't use CSP very much, and when they do use it, they usually use it wrong. Uh, so see, you know, most of the, these CSP policy usages don't don't use script SRC. Uh, and when they do use it, most of them don't use nonce. There are these other directives, unsafe inline and unsafe eval, that remove CSP's protections. They say, well, you know, it's okay. You can have inline scripts and you can, you can run code in eval. And that just subverts the whole thing. It just makes the whole thing kind of mostly useless. Uh, so there's a question of how do we increase adoption of CSP? We don't want people to use escape hatches that make CSP worthless. Instead, we want to make safer escape hatches. So one of these was strict dynamic, which allows you to insert other script tags later uh, because they were descendant from something that had a nonce. Um, but there are other kinds of programmability that people are very used to with HTML and JavaScript. And trusted types is a new feature coming to the web platform, which allows the use of these familiar DOM APIs, otherwise blocked by CSP, unless you use those bad escape hatches. Uh, and it makes sure that those things that are inserted go to what's called sanitizers. 
pieces of code that you've registered in JavaScript up front that um, can make sure that you're not inserting extra scripts or, or things that are bad. So here's an example from MDN. If we, uh, we what, what trusted types do is they try to run code at the beginning of when the page loads. They run this kind of create policy thing. Then you have a matching CSP header that is expecting a particular policy to be created. Uh, so then it won't, uh, it will check that that policy is always used. So this policy, for example, means whenever you create HTML, it's going to replace the uh, greater thans with less than. So you're not going to be able to construct any actual tags. So inner HTML, in this case, checks that you're only setting it with trusted HTML that was created via this policy. And when it's trusted, then it will have already been escaped by the sanitizer. Uh, this is a, a simple policy. There are other kind of more detailed policies. Actually, there's a sanitizer API also under development as a possible web standard, which, you know, people, when they write sanitizers, they usually do a bad job. So let's have the, the browser contain its own sanitizer. So Trusted Types was an effort initiated by Google. They uh, had some version of this, but just enforced through their um, build strategy in order to prevent cross-site scripting. And they wanted to add it to the web platform to improve enforcement and to broaden its deployment. In this case, it was shipped in Chrome without standardization, without even a, a detailed technical document uh, defining it, which is you know, not my favorite thing, but this was an important feature. Now uh, there's ongoing work to backfill the standard and backfill the, the uh, broad consensus building and uh, and uh, rigor, and this is going really well. At this point, uh, Safari and Firefox have come around in favor of the proposal. It's being developed in the W3C Web Application Security Working Group, also called Web AppSec, and implementation work is going on from, from Egalia in both those other browsers. Another aspect of Security is software supply chain security. This is about ensuring that you're not deploying vulnerable and outdated components. So this is extremely common. People just don't update their software. You know, things go end of life, and then at that point, it's not even considered uh, vulnerability anymore or relevant thing. You just get updates for the things that are not end of life. Or even if you're not end of life, a security update goes out and people just don't ship it. So using SBOMs, using software bills of material, help you identify where within your um, enterprise, people people start using the word enterprise a lot when it comes to software supply chain security, where where within like the whole swath of code that you're that you care about, you might be using something that is vulnerable and outdated in a way that you consider se severe. So OWASP has been developing Cyclone DX since 2017, but now we're pursuing formal standardization uh, with ECMA. And there's some benefits of this. So in, in some way, OWASP already publishes things that it, that it calls standards, and I think the OWASP standards process is, is strong. But there are further benefits to strengthening that with an established uh, standards developing organization like ECMA. So in this, we want to do a top-to-bottom review of the whole specification to make sure it makes sense. This is something we did with, with Cyclone DX. Otherwise, there's, there's sort of a, a relatively small core team that knows everything in the spec, but here we were able to broaden it. Actually, we, we recorded those meetings and published them on YouTube. So now if you want to learn about the whole Cyclone DX spec, you can come in and watch those YouTube videos on the Cyclone DX YouTube channel. Um, it was great to bring in more people to have the global picture. And international recognition through a formal standard could help drive adoption. So we created a technical committee within ECVA um, in general. 
standards bodies love getting new projects. You're not really going to go to a standards body and propose working on something, and then they'll say, well, that's just not uh, interesting. Uh, there, there may be problems like we have to work well with all, all stakeholders and be open and be rigorous, but everybody loves uh, working on new projects and expanding scope. So if you have a new project that you want to bring to standards, I recommend doing it. Uh, this is one that I worked with Steve Springett on, uh, proposing this to ECMA. Uh, the process in ECMA is that three members of ECMA, ECMA is an association that has members, but the members are, are um, organizations like companies or universities. So three members come together and propose a scope and program of work for a new technical committee. And then eventually it's, it's voted on in the ECMA General Assembly, just a fancy name we use for, for our board meetings. Uh, these happen, uh, every six months. You know, ECMA is based in Geneva, so kind of influenced by the UN and ISO and all these fancy organizations in the terms it uses. So here's what, uh, Steve and I came up with for the, or mo mostly Steve, uh, for the, for the scope and program of work of TC54. That's what we call the committee because it's the 54th technical committee of ECMA. And the model is slightly different from TC39. In TC39, we develop the language entirely in, in the committee. So we, we develop things on, on GitHub and we encourage all kinds of community participation. But the model of Cyclone DX is, is a bit different. There's already an open source process through the Cyclone DX community through the core working group. And the idea with TC54 is to leave that in place and to just add an extra step on the end to do, to do this extra validation. So ECMA is a, is a, an organization based on membership. And we really wanted to make sure that that didn't restrict participation in the development of Cyclone DX. That said, we also worked hard to make sure that TC54 itself was open to participants using, uh, for example, our invited experts process to bring in interested parties who are not members of ECMA. Um, so whenever features are added to Cyclone DX, after the, after the community and the core working group do their review, then TC54 also does a review and they may say, oh, uh, did you consider this? Maybe we should change this this thing, then it gets popped back to the community to do those technical changes. This group was initiated by Bloomberg, ServiceNow, and IBM, and now several other companies have joined, including Lockheed Martin, but also nonprofits like the Open Source Business Alliance. And here's a, here's a diagram explaining that <coughs> this model of starting out in the community and then the core working group uh, process and then review in, in TC54. And I'm happy to announce that ECMA International has approved OWASP Cyclone DX 1.6 as standard uh, just this past Wednesday. Uh, <laughs> so going forward, we need your help to make secure standards. We need security experts in standards. Everyone is trying to do right by security, but uh, many participants in standards are more an expert on the space that they're standardizing than on possible security issues. We need to broaden that experience and perspective and have a variety of different security approaches represented. We also need application developers in standards. Sometimes security-motivated features like CSB are too hard to use, and then applications don't use them. So this led to these bad escape hatches being used and also led to, to under-deployment. So developer involvement in prototyping and review of potential standards helps when in the design process. We also need red teams. We need people doing critical analysis of proposed standards how could someone break this? Oftentimes there are prototypes really built for, uh, for standards before they're finalized. And it's great to try those out and, uh, hack into them and 
uh, identify the problems ahead of time. And generally, because these processes usually take years, we, we really want to take the time to get it right. And so it's really appreciated when people bring these issues. And you can be involved in standards. The majority of standards work is done on GitHub and completely open to everybody. There's also standards organizations to join. If you want to participate in a formal standards meeting, then either joining a, uh, joining a standards organization is the, the best way to do so. You can also propose new efforts. I think there, there are a number of OAuth standards that if it's interesting to them, I would be very happy to, to work with you to consider them as standards in ECMA or, or other standards developing organizations. So please get in touch with me if you're interested in that. And thank you. Thank you so much. It was very, very informative. At least for me. Thanks. Uh, it's time for Q and A. If anybody has any question, if not, I have uh, one question for myself as well. Uh, in terms of uh, HTML API sanitizers, despite of other methods, could you please elaborate how is has advantage. Ah, well, when you sanitize HTML, it, you, you might need a different algorithm depending on the context or depending on what you're, uh, controlling for. There's also a somewhat complicated grammar of HTML that most people don't fully understand. So the HTML sanitizer solves for, for both those issues. And this is something that is available in Chrome. Uh, and just being actively developed, or sorry, I'm not sure whether it's shipped or behind a flag, but it's uh, it's under active development. Great, thank you. Thank you so much, everybody, for participating.